Welcome everybody as you guys are all trickling in. Um, hello. <laughs> Quick hello. We're going to give it a, a minute or two while people start joining. Uh, we've got a big list of people today, which is super exciting because we have Wes Bush joining us uh, for a little product-led growth masterclass. So we're expecting quite a few people. We're going to give it another minute or so. Uh, I see all you beautiful joiners. <laughs> How are things on your end, Wes? Things are pretty darn good. I am having a great day. How about you? I'm good. How's Canada? Is it snowing yet? Yeah. Okay. So like confession, I really don't like winter. And oh, confession. Neither do I. That's why I moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so like, I'm trying to uh, like find ways of like, hey, like, here's what I do like about it. So today I went swimming in the morning and right. like, like, I was super hot. And like, like the one thing I loved, I was like, oh my goodness. Like when you go outside, it's like, it feels amazing. I'm like, you don't have to pay for the air conditioning. <laughs> Canada's just always cold in the winter. So yeah, I'm finding the, the silver lining, <laughs> trying to. I totally get that. Um, I I mean, I am actually crazy enough to go swimming here in the winter. I've done it a couple of times. Um, and oh, like swimming, the polar bear I mean, kind of like swimming? In, like in the sea kind of swimming. <laughs> oh, wow. Like it's cold, but it might be too cold for, for my Canadian body as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> a bit too much. I've done it once or twice, but probably we'll do it again. Um, cool. So we, we've got quite a few people in. We're going to stop talking about ourselves um, and talk about Wes. <laughs> Uh, so before we get started, yes, this is being recorded. So if you have to pop out at any time, don't worry about it. We will be sending the recording uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, if you have any questions, drop them into either the chat or the Q&A. If you can, do it on the Q&A so we can field the questions a little bit better. Uh, and we'll have the Q&A at the end. And Wes will be, uh, will be answering you. So with that said, Wes, go ahead. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me here. This is honestly one of my favorite topics to dig into. Um, I really did fall into the world of product, and I'll share a bit more about my background too as we go through this and kick this off. Um, but you're going to be in for a treat. This is going to be a ton of fun as we dissect what is product-led growth. And so before I really start chatting all about this topic I'm super excited about, um, I do want to let everyone know who's here. Like, since you showed up live, like, please, in the chat, like, let me know your questions as we go through this. Um, I want to try and make this as interactive as possible. So um, please be a part of the conversation if you do want me to dig into extra pieces of this. And if we don't have a chance to get through it as we're going through the presentation, I will be saving some time at the end so we can definitely go through some of those questions. So without further ado, today we're going to do a deep dive into what product-led growth is all about. Um, but before I go into this, I just want to spend about one minute introducing myself because there's a ton of people out there who love teaching online, but a lot of them just don't actually know what they're talking about. And it drives me a bit crazy. So uh, my name is Wes Bush, and I wrote the best-selling book on product-led book on product like growth, not book. And yes, it's an actual book, uh, not just an ebook. And I host the Product Led Summit and podcast where we dissect every year hundreds of the world's top SaaS leaders um, and really just try and understand what are the patterns that drive successful product led businesses. Now, I'd argue that I've spent more time digging into the actual how behind how to build a product led business than anyone else on this planet, but this crazy obsession around product-led growth didn't always exist. So you see, back in about 2016, I was in demand generation at Vidyard. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, like, what the hell is demand generation? Think of it as like digital marketing, basically, just different word. And I was following the traditional SaaS growth playbook when I was at Vidyard. Um, you probably would know this one. <laughs> it's very familiar to a lot of us. It looks like you uh, create a bunch of content, you put it behind this lead form, and then send those people a ton of emails until one day, hopefully they request a demo and turn into a customer. 
Um, so yes, I would label myself back in 2016 as probably one of those annoying marketers. Um, and I just couldn't help feel like there was a better way to do marketing because I myself typically didn't request a demo unless I really, really, really wanted to purchase a software product. Um, I'm sure you can probably relate. Let me know if you're the same whenever it comes to purchasing products. Um, the requested demo, just you have to be further on in the evaluation phase to even consider it. And so the products I used and loved all the time, they typically let me sign up for free and experience the value of the product all before asking me to pay up front. Maybe you can relate. When we think about the products we use every day, whether it's the Slacks, the Zooms, Netflix, or even Asana, the majority of the tools we sign up for let us get started on our own without talking to anyone. So when I, I helped launch a freemium product at Vidyard back in 2016, I was super excited, but one thing I didn't quite expect that would result from launching a freemium product at Vidyard was that we would go from zero to 100,000 users in less than 12 months. And so such rapid growth brought on a ton of new challenges around how to build a product-led business. And so since working at Vidyard, I really had the opportunity to consult for some of the world's fastest growing brands and help them build successful product-led business. Um, so that's really what we're going to be digging into today in this masterclass is not just how you can build a product led business, but, um, what is it all about? And so when we're looking at what we're going to cover today, um, there's really four main things. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page around what is product led growth and then why it's becoming of rising importance and also, um, why are organizations opting to be product-led growth? So you can really pull away um, some of the main benefits that you want from this go-to-market strategy. And then I'll just end on what you could do to become product-led growth, a uh, product-led. And Adam, thank you for the shout out. I'm glad you liked the slides. At least they're pretty. <laughs> awesome. So first piece here is what is product-led growth? Um, although the term product-led growth is relatively new in the SaaS space, um, product-led growth has already impacted so many on other industries. So if you don't believe me, I'll give you some examples here to get you thinking about this in different contexts. So think about how you buy each of these products, whether it's cologne, cars, or even shoes. What do you typically do before buying these products? I want you to think about this. What do you typically do before buying any of these products? Now, in each of these cases, the product actually does the majority of the selling. And this is made possible by letting you try before you buy. If instead of telling you, for instance, how your new car will look and feel on the road, um, most good salesmen will give you the keys so you can take it out on a test drive and see for yourself. Now, instead of telling you how amazing you'll smell with a particular bottle of cologne or maybe perfume, most sales reps will actually let you smell it before you buy. And when it comes to even buying shoes, instead of describing just how good that shoe will fit you, most often or not, you're going to try it on and see if it fits. And so you might not have thought of any of these industries as being product-led, but at its core, each of them is using the product to help make the sale. And so this really comes down to, if you want to succeed and sell to the modern buyer, you really need to get crystal clear on figuring out uh, that the way you sell and how you sell is just as important as what you're selling. And this is largely when we look at the trends over the last decade, we found that consumers just trust brands a lot less. And we've all been burned in the past. And I'll give you an example here. So as experienced buyers, we know talk is cheap and brand promises are cheap because anyone can create a website and tell you that they have this magic pill that will make you grow five feet taller in five minutes. And so when we think about that, um, well, we know that's baloney. 
because we know they can't deliver on that particular promise. And so with everyday purchases, sometimes it's hard to tell who is running a legitimate business and who's not. So that's actually where this whole concept of product lead growth comes into play because you could hire a world-class sales team to tell people um, what your product can do. Um, but people will still be wondering in the back of their heads, you know what, can this product actually deliver on its promise? Now that one question, it puts a ton of risk on the buyer because they have to take your word for it that your product can do what it said it would. Now this might have worked back in the good old days of sales where a handshake would seal the deal, but I'd argue that those days are long gone. To sell to the modern buyer, you need to do one thing and you need to do it incredibly well. And that is show versus tell. Now that doesn't mean in your marketing, your messaging, you're never gonna tell people about your product. Of course, of course you eventually have to tell people to some degree what your product is all about. And I'm not telling you don't read any like messaging or positioning books or don't put any text on your website, not at all. I'm referring to what is the experience you're leading with? Are you going to show people the value of your product or are you just going to simply tell them all about it? And so when someone experiences the value of your product, what they're really doing is convincing themselves why they need your product in their lives versus when you tell someone why they should purchase your product, you're just trying to convince them why they should buy your product. So I wanna ask everyone here, which strategy do you think is more effective to lead with as a business? Showing people the value of your product or telling them the value of your product? So if you are voting here, uh, just type show, if that's the strategy you believe that is gonna be the most effective to sell to the modern buyer, or put tell if you still believe um, that just telling people about your product is good enough to make the sale. All right. Uh, so we're getting so a lot of shows for sure. Absolutely. It's good to see them rolling in. Thank you everyone for voting. And <laughs> yes, Nicole, a little obvious, but <laughs> yeah. sometimes there's some outliers and I'd like to get a discussion going, but no, this is awesome. Thank you everyone for voting. So yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the whole reason I'm here today is because showing your product's value is far more effective than simply telling people about it. But it's not just my opinion. Over the next five minutes, I'm gonna share why product-led growth is becoming of rising importance on a macro level. Because once you hear these reasons, you'll understand that product-led growth is here for the long haul. And if you don't adapt, you're actually gonna be putting your business at risk. So let's dive in. So the three tidal waves that are coming for your business right now um, are really powerful market trends that have actually no signs of slowing down. If anything, they are picking up speed and gaining more traction. And so if you don't adapt and prepare for these tidal waves, they're going to quite literally smash into your business and wreck havoc. So the first one that I'll walk you through is just the fact that technology is deflationary in nature. And it's actually always been this way. If you want, uh, if you don't believe me on this fact, there is an amazing book called The Price of Tomorrow. If you want to spend five hours on Audible going through a million different examples, <laughs> he will break it down for you better than I can do in this next minute. But I'll give you a couple examples just to share uh, some thoughts around this. So when we think about even just hard drive space, for instance, um, what we pay now for about a terabyte of hard drive space is around under $100. But not too long ago, to get that amount of space, it used to cost millions of dollars. So that's just one instance of technology is getting a lot cheaper and more affordable for everyone. So in every industry in tech, 
is really just this race to the bottom. High profit margins attract competition like moss to a light. And whenever we're thinking about this, uh, what does this mean for your business? All in all, the fact that technology is deflationary in nature means that uh, when it comes to customer willingness to pay for features, <laughs> customers, that's you and me, we want to pay less for better tech next year. And we expect that. And so over the last five years, ProfitWell did a very interesting study that found that over the last five years, there has been a 30% drop in customer willingness to pay for features in just the last five years. Um, and that sign is actually showing no signs of stopping. And so that's pretty scary when you think about it. People want to pay less for your technology than they did last year. And the next piece, tidal wave, is really just the fact that startups are more expensive to grow. And so uh, whenever we think about this, um, a large part of this is because of the low barrier to entry. Competition has literally exploded. I mean, if we take the famous MarTech landscape, um, this is it in 2011. Nine years later, we're looking at this and we see that, yes, those dots are logos. There has been a 5,233% growth of this landscape since 2011. And this is just the MarTech landscape. And so what does this mean when we look at different marketing channels? Well, as a result of this competition, it's just becoming more expensive to acquire customers. I'm not going to go through all of these since you are smart. You can read much faster than me. Um, I will go through the first one. So Facebook, there was a 171% increase in cost per thousand impressions. So that basically means there was 171% more expensive to advertise on Facebook in 2017. And so it's just becoming more expensive as we go on. And when we look at this, this is another report from ProfitWell around customer acquisition costs. Over the last five years, there has been a 55% increase in customer acquisition costs just the last five years. So what this really comes down to when we look at these first two tidal waves is on one hand, you have your customer acquisition costs going up every single year. And on the other end, you have the willingness to pay for your products going down. So if you don't do anything in your business, if you don't change any of your strategies, you will eventually wind up in break even zone. And if you really don't change anything and adapt, you will be starting to run an unprofitable business, which is very scary uh, if you think about it. And so it's really, if you don't change anything, what I'm really trying to get you to think about is that uh, it's just a matter of time before you're running a profitable business if you don't adapt in this current market environment. And the last one I'll touch on that's pretty quick, it's just the fact that your buyer has changed. When we're looking at even just the, the way people are buying today, a lot of people will think, hey, you know, those enterprise buyers, they like to, to jump hoops and go through the enterprise sales process we put together. We think it's pretty smart. No, not at all. Um, Gainsight's done a lot of research on this too. And they found that, well, actually, no, enterprise buyers expect to try and evaluate software in an easy, frictionless way. They want that self-serve experience. Maybe not for the entire experience, but they want to lead with that as they learn more about your product. As such, product experiences actually just become a part of the buying process. And so I want to really just break these three down. These are the three tidal waves that aren't stopping anytime soon. They are here to stay. And really at the end of the day, consumers like us, we actually demand it. And so your SaaS business might be able to weather maybe one of these tidal waves, but do you really want to take a chance on surviving all three of them? So that's the challenge. I want to get you thinking about from the external factors, like what is contributing to the rising popularity of product-led growth. And a lot of it comes down to these main three tidal waves. They are not going to slow down. And so I don't wanna be this Dr. Doomsday because I don't like playing that role too much. Um, I wanna kind of switch gears here and start getting you to think about, well, you know what, maybe it's not just about this scary tidal wave analogies Wes is putting out here. Maybe there's also some other good reasons why organizations are opting to be product-led. 
because there are so many good reasons why organizations are opting to be product-led. Um, but before I get into these main benefits of product-led growth, I want to just ask you some questions. These are going to be rhetorical, but I want you to try and answer them. And it's going to be getting you to think about why did companies, some big companies you probably have heard of, make these big risks and big decisions around becoming more product-led. So the first one is, why did HubSpot disrupt their successful inbound marketing model to double down on product-led growth? They didn't have to launch a freemium product. They didn't have to give away their CRM for free. They could have just used their successful inbound marketing model to fuel their sales funnel. Why did they change things? And how did Zoom go from 10 million to 200 million daily active users in just three months? Now, I got some smart comics last time saying the pandemic, obviously, but yeah, why did people choose Zoom versus other platforms? There's a ton of options on the market of what you could do without Zoom. And so why did people choose Zoom uh, during this time to use so many of their calls? And then the last one is how did Mixmax achieve a $0 customer acquisition cost? That's pretty cool. That's pretty crazy. And so there's two big pieces going on here between each of these companies. And I'll touch on the first one as it relates to why organizations were opting proactively to become product led. So the first one is really just the fact that they wanted to build a dominant growth engine for their business. And I'll break this down in a couple of different pieces so you can see how being product-led helps you get here. Um, but this is the overarching piece here is just like, how do you get here? Why are organizations becoming product-led? It really comes down to this dominant growth engine. So one of the, the first things I hear almost every time a company launches a free trial or a freemium model when they previously only had a demo request button on their website is they'll come to me and say, Wes, I now have 20 to 30% more signups than I did before. 20 to 30% more signups. Why is that the case? That's a ton of extra signups. When we think about, well, you just changed going from basically promoting your demo request to promoting your free trial or freemium model. Why did you get 20 to 30% more people signing up? That's a ton of volume, especially depending on bigger businesses. Well, part of the answer here is really that you're capturing people in your funnel earlier in their customer journey. They're not quite ready potentially to request a demo, but they'd actually love to test out your product and see if it's a good fit. And if you have an incredible onboarding experience, you can actually turn these evaluators into happy paying customers before they spend time evaluating your competitors' products, which is pretty cool. The next big piece of building a dominant growth engine really just comes down to rapid global scale. So while your competitors are busy hiring new regional sales reps across the world, you can actually just focus on improving your onboarding to service more customers around the world in a fraction of the time. So I want to get back to Zoom. I asked you at the beginning, all right, how did Zoom go from 10 million to 200 million daily active users in just three months? Um, so I'm arguing here that had Zoom not had a product-led model during the COVID pandemic, there was actually no way it would have been possible for them to go from 10 million to 200 million daily active users in just three months without spending a fortune on hiring countless sales reps. I want you to just imagine here, how many demo requests do you think Zoom would have to do to find those 190 million daily active users during that three month period. So because I was very curious and had some extra time on my hands, um, I actually did the math for you here. I think it's kind of fun to dig into this. So if there was, we just say like for every person, we're not looking at close rates here, but if we had to give a demo to every single person out of that 190 million users who just signed up over the last three months and started using Zoom, um, they would have to essentially do 2 million demos per day, including weekends. And if they had a really dedicated sales 
team that uh, was really great at doing demos consistently and they could do 16 30 minute demos every single day of the week, they would still need a sales force of 131,944 people. So that's, that's a ton of sales folks and overhead to cover when we think about that. And so what I want you to think about here is, well, even if Zoom did pull that off, the problem is you would be footing the bill for that expensive sales organization. And this is largely because, well, the more expensive it is for you to sell something, the more expensive it is to buy as a consumer. And so that's one of the other big competitive advantages of product-led businesses versus a more traditional sales-led company is that you can operate in a lot of different uh, markets and segments where it might be unprofitable for your competitors to operate, but because you built an efficient business model, you can operate in those areas and still generate a significant profit. And so the last piece of really just building this dominant growth engine really comes down to compound versus linear growth. In a traditional sales-led company, your main lever of growth is hiring new sales reps. For every additional sales rep, you might hope for X bump in revenue, let's say $500,000 or a million uh, quota for that sales rep. And whereas in a product-led company, you might only have a wimpy looking 1% month over month increase in your free to paid conversion rate. But the difference is that that growth compounds without necessarily investing a lot more in the business. So in a product-led business, the cool thing is your growth isn't actually dependent on adding more headcount. It's dependent on how methodical you are about building your growth engine. And so that really brings us to the second really exciting reason why so many companies are now opting to become product-led. And this all comes down to capital efficiency. And a large part of this comes down to just a better, lower customer acquisition costs. We can acquire customers a lot more affordable uh, than the counterparts of a sales that company. Back to that first example too, I was giving about whenever a lot of these companies start uh, launching a free trial free model, they see that 20 to 30% more signups than their previous month. And so that really helps them just acquire a ton more customers if they've done some of the right pieces, which I'll get into around how to become product led. And so um, like we mentioned, CACs have increased by over 50% in the last five years. Um, so what's interesting about this is when we started studying product led businesses, we realized that actually a lot of them had a significant reduction in their customer acquisition costs. And this isn't because the marketing channels are getting a lot more affordable. This is actually largely because they're handholding their users less. Um, and instead, what they're doing with that money they're saving on their customer acquisition costs is they're actually investing that into the product so they can really build a much better product experience for people. And another reason why they're saving a ton on the customer acquisition costs is they're removing a ton of friction from the sales rep. And this helps them get faster sales cycles because people can sign up on their own schedule and start using the product on their own time without having to book a demo with anyone. And this all in all comes down to building trust faster. At the very beginning, when I was talking about what is product-led growth and what is the main fundamental difference of this strategy, it comes down to we're showing people the value of our product versus just simply telling people about it. And really when it comes to selling to the modern buyer, we need to start showing people the value of our product to build trust and being product-led helps out with that in a huge way. And the last piece of building a capital efficient business really comes down to this high revenue per employee concept. And so I'll share with you two businesses, which I think are doing a really interesting job of building a very profitable business, um, but not actually focusing on scaling headcount at the same time. So there's two businesses here. There is Ahrefs and ConvertKit. Ahrefs is really, uh, they're already over 50 million annual recurring revenue and they just have 50 employees. And so they're proactively building this uh, growth engine for their business by really investing in their product, investing and in creating the best product experience they can. Um, whereas they're not really focused on scaling headcount, hiring more sales reps uh, as they grow 
and build their business. And so uh, this really is, when we're thinking about it, is an overarching business strategy. It's just a more efficient way of growing your business. But I want to kind of pause here and get you to think about, all right, we've gone through all of the benefits of product-led growth. Uh, at one point or another, I have covered each of these. But I want you in the chat to share out of each of these, there's eight main benefits of product-led growth I've shared. Which one gets you the most excited whenever it comes to being product-led? I want to hear what you have to say. Let me know in the chat which one of these benefits of product-led growth uh, gets you the most excited and you want to really uh, dig into. Better user experience, Paul, compound growth. Uh, Charles won, so that is Dominant Growth Engine. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Keep going. I almost, I almost want to say it doesn't surprise me to see uh, number eight popping up because most of us are product managers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I was going to say, I, I think uh, for me, it would probably be one as I'm growth and also eight as I'm product. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's super interesting to see everyone. So thanks again for contributing. I love it. And... Okay, so yeah, there is a few people focusing on the lower CAC, but yeah, by far a lot more on the better user experience and dominant growth engine. Awesome. So thank you everyone for sharing again and feel free to, to keep going there if you wanna add more in the chat. Um, but in a world where competition has literally exploded, um, reducing your customer acquisition costs and growing faster can quite literally be the difference between being the market leader or just one of those me too brands that's competing in the space. So the question really becomes here, do you wanna be the leader or the follower in your market? And if you want to be the leader and stay the leader, I'm arguing here that you really do need to learn how to become product led. And so that's actually gonna be the next portion of this talk here is really just focusing on, well, okay, we've talked a lot about the benefits of product-led growth, um, why it's becoming of rising importance and what this is all about, but how do we do this? And I think there's a couple common misconceptions here um, that I just wanna bust <laughs> as we go through it. Um, so you don't think it's just uh, what it's not cracked up to be. So the, one of the first ones I hear a lot is that, well, being product-led um, doesn't just mean you now give your product team the ranks to run the entire business their way, or you, on the other side, fire your entire sales team because the product now sells itself. No, <laughs> those are common myths whenever it comes to building a product-led business. What I'm advocating here is that being a product-led business, it really takes an entire organization to make the strategy work. Because in a product-led organization, every single team plays an important part. And I'll give you an example here too. So a product-led marketing team can start asking themselves, well, how could we use the product as the number one lead magnet? I'll give you another example for marketing teams too. So ConvertKit, they are a email marketing platform where you can send emails to your subscribers, but they as a marketing team actually came up with the idea with launching a free landing page tool for their user base. And so that was just, they're going into the well-established landing page tool software space and just saying, this is free, enjoy the product. And it was a powerful lead magnet for them to get a ton of extra users. And so their marketing team was actually thinking about the product and how we could use it to hit our goals. We'll give you another example. So a product-led sales team can start asking, well, how could we use this product to qualify our prospects for us? That way, whenever you have conversations with people, um, they already understand the value of your product. And instead of having really uh, surface level discussions, you can really be talking with people who understand the value and you can help them, whether it's build an internal business case for getting your product into the company or maybe just something else completely. And whenever it comes to even just your customer success team, they can now ask themselves, well, how could we help our customers become successful without our help? 
And so what I'm trying to get you to think about is every team in a product-led organization plays an important part in helping users become successful. So the biggest difference between being sales-led and product-led really comes down to how do you define success? So in a sales-led company, success is often defined as closing a deal. We ring the bell in the office to signify success because we've closed the deal. We celebrate that moment. It's exciting. Whereas in a product-led business, it's quite different. Um, and success can take on a whole new meaning because product-led companies live and die by user success. And that might sound quite stark, uh, but here's an example here. If your users can't figure out how to get value from your product, game over. You just won't be able to make the model work because when you're leading with your product's value, whether that's in a free trial or a freemium model, you literally have to get really good at manufacturing successful users before they're going to ever consider taking the next step and purchasing your product. And so um, when we deliver value up front before our paywall, what I'm arguing here is that you won't just have a new customer, you'll also have an advocate. So the big secret behind becoming product-led growth, if you might want to write this one down because it's going to simplify what product-led growth is all about, but I keep reciting this same sentence again and again because I really feel like it summarizes what it means to be product-led and how you can become product-led because your user's success will eventually become your success. That is what I'm defining as the whole secret behind product-led growth. Because when you align your company's success with your user success, something incredible happens. It sends signals to everyone on your team that this is just an organization that believes its product isn't just something you sell. It's how you serve others. And so to really wrap up here, I want to make sure we're all on the same page that the way we sell has changed. I remember at the beginning, most people were saying that the, the most effective way to, to sell to people nowadays is really just to show them versus tell them about it. And that rings true because it used to be enough to just simply shake someone's hand and trust that their solution would solve a problem without much proof. Um, but those days are long gone. Today, a strong brand and social proof are no longer enough to build trust with the modern buyer. You need to let people try before they buy and show value before a paywall. And product-led growth, quite simply, is just how you turn that whole approach into an executable business strategy. So to sell to the modern buyer, you really need to decide, are you going to be product-led or will you be disrupted? Now, history tells us that how you sell is just as important as what you sell. Just like Blockbuster couldn't compete with Netflix by selling the same digital content, you need to decide when, not if, you'll need to innovate on the way you sell. So. Thank you so much for digging into this masterclass on product-led growth today. If you do want to learn more about it and how to build a more successful product-led business, um, the best place, honestly, start with the book on product-led growth, or you can just check out all our free stuff at productled.com. But thank you so much for going through, adding your questions, participating in this discussion. I'm going to stay here to answer as many of your questions as I physically can during the rest of the time we have together. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, and just to add, uh, if no one has attended the Project-Led Summit, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. um, please do so. <laughs> I've spoken in the past. Jana has spoken in the past. Uh, there's a lot of really, really awesome speakers. Um, and the next one is in January, is that correct? Yeah, it's coming up. I just put the link here if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Uh, I will be doing one on how to define a product adoption strategy, which is going to be super, super exciting. But let's get to questions. I'm going to start with a fun question. Um, 
just to take a breather, which is why do Canadians complain about winter so much? <laughs> it's because we get eight months of it, Peter. Yeah. That's why. We don't get a week or two. We get eight months. Yep, it's quite that, a long time. <laughs> that is why we complain. Uh, but on to, on to more product-led growthy questions. Um, it's part of our national identity. Yes, it is. Um, what monetization trends do you see continuing or starting in 2021? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so one of the, the big trends I see is really just whenever it comes to how do you charge people? Are you charging people based on just pure features? Or are you charging based on consumption or the value they're, they're getting from the product? And so over the last like 10 years, what I, I've seen is just more companies leading into whenever they charge, it's usually based on some sort of consumption or value metric. And so I'm going to see that again and again. And this comes also down to whenever you're making this big transition from being more sales led to product led, what I see a lot of the time is you really do need to reevaluate your monetization strategy because maybe when you were pure sales led, like you were hiding um, your pricing and just like using that as a reason for people to reach out to your sales team. And so you do need to have to reevaluate that. And so whenever you're thinking about like, what do I give away for free versus what do I put behind a paywall? I mean, that's a whole nother can of worms, but it really um, gets easier when you start identifying like, what is that value metric that we're going to charge by? And to give you an example of if you're listening, you're like, what, what is that? Um, I'll give you an example with Active Campaign or like HubSpot, like a lot of those uh, companies that have a marketing tool or a CRM, like it's per contact, that's, that's pretty common, it's well established. That's a value metric, that's how they charge. MailChimp had the famous like 2000 subscribers, you can send emails to them for free. And so it's great because you can give people uh, a certain amount of that value metric. And then as they scale, they have to upgrade. And so the problem I see as it relates to monetization with product-led companies, when you start charging just based on features, is that, well, um, someone might have to pay for it before they try it. And so you want to make sure that they are able to use the core value of your product before they have to pay so they understand what it's all about, how it can help them. And it's an easier um, jump for them to make. It's less risky at the end of the day. So great question. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, the next one is, uh, how would you do try before you buy uh, with a product like insurance? That's a really interesting question. Yeah. And so every industry is going to be completely different if it is insurance and you're trying to figure out like how that would really work. Um, you might have to be just like focusing on like free evaluation or something like that's more, uh, top of funnel, maybe not focus specifically on like, I'm just imagining like an example here, like you for free and sharing like a mansion or a multi-million dollar mansion. And I don't know, you insure it free for a day. Like that'd be pretty risky as a business. And I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> so um, that's something where you could think about, well, maybe there is something that you could insure for free very quickly. Um, and it would be a low risk for the business too. So um, that's super contextual based on your industry, which I love to uh, jam on. If you have extra questions about that and you want to dig into it, um, feel free to just reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can chat about it. Cool. Uh, next one is, why is Tidal Wave 1 a challenge? It's really a challenge because your customer willingness to pay is always going to go down. And when we think about that as like fast forward 10 years, well, it drops 30% in the last five years. Maybe it's going to be 60% in the next uh, five years. And so when your customer willingness to pay goes down, like if you're not adding extra value or you're not really innovating as a business, well, your margins are just going to become a lot less. And when that happens as a business, maybe you just have less money to invest in the product or different areas that will further your competitive advantage. And so and that's really why it's scary uh, whenever we think about the customer willingness to pay is always going to be going down in SaaS. And that's not just SaaS, like any industry, 
eventually will become commoditized unless there's some sort of like government regulations or something in the way that uh, messes up with actual market dynamics. That's how it will typically work out. Well, cool, thank you. Um, I really like the next question because it also lines up with it being a product management question. <laughs> um, so how do you balance the benefit of opening up your product to potential customers with the risk of revealing your competitive advantage to competitors, particularly if competitors are larger and have more resources to copy your features? Yeah, I, I think Heat and Shaw have like the best quote for this and I'll rip it off him but give him credit. <laughs> and so it's basically like it's not the, the first half of the idea that is going to um, really win in the market. It's always the first to scale. And so um, whenever it comes to thinking about, OK, like, do we hide all our features and, you know, just put it behind a gate and no one can try it? Um, that's actually might actually be doing you disservice for a good amount of time. And so what I always recommend is like, try and see if those, that is actually a competitive advantage to your customers and launch it and see what those things are. And so I'd um, love to hear your thoughts on that one too, Andrea, and how you would deal with that. Um, yeah, so I, I always say, I mean, if your competitors want to see what you're doing, they're gonna see it regardless. <laughs> Don't worry right. too much. Um, and this is why I always also tell people not don't worry so much about your roadmap being public or not. Ours is public. Um, it's also the only product management tool that has a public roadmap, which is really funny. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, having a roadmap or having your product be open, it doesn't actually run you the risk of people copying you because someone may want to or try to copy a feature, but it doesn't mean that they're going to do it with the same vision and the same objective that you did. Um, and, and we've had that experience, you know, competitors have copied your features, but the way they do it doesn't align with what our actual feature does, if that makes any sense. Um, so your, when you build something, you build it to solve a problem and you build it with your customer's objectives and your own validation and your own discovery and someone coming along and trying to copy that isn't going to have the same results. Um, so, so don't worry too much about that because you're doing it with your own purpose. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, next question. Uh, there is no such thing as a dumb question, by the way, uh, to, to the person that is asking this. Uh, but it sounds to, uh, to, well, not to me, but to this person that all you need is a free trial and self-serve uh, onboarding in order to be product-led. Is this correct? Yeah, great question. And a common misconception because, yeah, it, on the surface level, that's what it looks like. You might just see this company have a free trial, free model. You say, hey, they're being product led. Now here's the tricky piece. And this gets kind of interesting is the companies can have a free trial and free model and still be sales led. It's not just about that uh, because even in those cases where I've seen a free trial, free model for a company and they just treat these leads uh, or these users like leads for their sales team. They just follow up with them. They go through the same sales process they were doing before with the demo requests. Uh, now they can use the product, which is a step better in that direction. But it was like from a company perspective, they're just treating them the same. There's no onboarding. There's no support for these people. And they just want to put them through this as more of like a lead magnet. And then they will eventually just convert them or try to convert them, get them on the demo request and sell them that way. So yeah, it really does um, have to be a full organization to be, in my opinion, truly product led. And that's what I was trying to cover at the end of just around like, how do you become product led? Because it does take your marketing team, your product team, your sales team, your support team to really make it work. And there's a lot of problems that pop up whenever you do start leaning into becoming more product led. Like you're, for instance, if you go freemium, you might get a ton of support requests. So, well, what's your support team going to do? Um, are they going to start manually jumping on all calls to help these people out? Or are they going to figure out a self-serve way to help these people? And so your company has to act differently as you roll this out. And so um, a great question because yeah, common misconception, but it does take a team to make it work. 
Cool. Uh, we have a really interesting one, um, which is we are a membership organization where the product is um, experiential in nature. They have to go to the, uh, the affiliates directly to experience it. What are some good ways to get people to take that step and good metrics around that? I'm curious what this looks like, but um, Nicole, I'm imagining like, is this more of like an affiliate kind of relationship? Like you have your membership, people sign up for it and then they can like click on like different tools and stuff you're using as affiliates. Uh, you get like some sort of commission off that and then they would use your partner's tools. Um, is that what it's like? Okay, Rotary Clubs. Yeah, and so in this case around how, I was trying to be an honest. <laughs> Sorry to blow your cover. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as it relates to that, I mean, if you're directing people to those affiliates, um, in that case, it can be a bit tricky because there's a lot more that's out of your control. Um, I would more so like focus around as a membership organization, like how are you um, getting people to start off with some sort of free experience so you can show them the value and not just simply tell them about it? So I would more so focus on that. But um, once again, like the insurance question too, a lot of these things are kind of hard to do on, on the spot around what it is specifically for your business. So um, great question, but I wish it could be more helpful. The good news though is that you can contact Wes um, yes. after this. So we're not entirely dropping your question. <laughs> um, the next question is, do you have examples um, of companies with complex feature rich products that have transformed from being sales led to product led? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the ones I did cover uh, or didn't touch on too much, but was HubSpot. So they have really complex products, uh, products. It's a multi-product company. And so they started with sidekick which was their chrome plugin for sales reps uh, it eventually had a freemium model and then they saw good success using that model and then they eventually rolled out free crm and had more parts of their product um, that definitely were leading with their product so yeah there is some good examples of there for hubspot there's also um Arty station in brazil they're doing really great things on this um out systems they are uh, still in the process. Uh, another Canadian one is Vendasta. Um, oh, they're really good. Yeah, like they, they got some really great thoughts. If you go to the um, Product Led Summit link I uh, sent earlier to um, Jacqueline Cook, that's their like chief strategy officer at Vendasta. She did a really incredible talk on just how they made this transition from sales led to product led and like her graphics and everything around it were fantastic of just visualizing how you change your organization as you go through this. So um, I definitely recommend checking that out. Cool, thank you. Um, can you dive a bit deeper into how Zoom went from 10 million to 200 million? Yeah, so as far as that goes, it was really just focused on like people using Zoom. So like if you were using Zoom and you had invited people to it, uh, that's one of the easiest ways that Zoom had that viral growth because part of the product is uh, viral in nature because if you want to use the product, you might use it for yourself, but then you want to use it with a colleague. Then you see a good experience. It just actually works. And then you now get to check it out, see if you want to use it for your own meetings. And so um, that's really how it spread initially for that first jump from 10 to 190 million users. Um, but what I was like echoing there in that section of the presentation was really just, there was no other way they could have done that if they didn't have this touchless self-serve experience, um, just because the volume and the amount of demos they'd have to do to even just educate people on what the product can do um, would be overwhelming uh, for them to approach just that amount of growth. I hope that answered your question, anonymous attendee. <laughs> um, <laughs> what trends, if any, have you seen in great product-led marketing organizational structures? Yeah, so as far as marketing, I gave that example about ConvertKit and them just giving away the landing page tool that is 
like different products, not their main offering, but they created the product and it really was a fantastic way of just getting more users aware about the product. They could go into that uh, market and just offer a free tool that, and they didn't really care as much about monetizing it because it was just focused on getting more users into their ecosystem so they could generate leads with the landing pages and then they could send them emails with their main tool. And so um, when it comes to the marketing teams, I think it's just a, a fantastic way of thinking about, well, we could, for instance, to get that same goal of let's say, you know, maybe 2000 signups per month. Uh, if we were to do that, well, we could do the traditional route of writing, you know, a hundred blog posts or something like that, whatever it would take to get to that outcome every month. Um, which would be great. Like you could learn how to write better landing pages and get those leads in general, but to the end user, what do you think is more helpful? Is it just reading simple articles about uh, how to edit your landing page and how to make a high converting landing page? Or could you just do it? Could you give them the, the right templates? They change a couple of things, then they have those landing pages that are generating leads. Um, it all comes down to um, Tara from Sprout Social, she shared this awesome quote around just like the way marketing needs to think differently. Um, and marketing for the longest time has been thought about marketing equals create demand. And that's what we've been thought and told and taught in school when it comes to marketing. But I think we're looking at marketing in a whole new lens nowadays around really just that marketing equals creating value. It's not just about creating demand. We need to create value for people. And when you start leading with that, um, it's quite powerful. And I'll give you another example too for marketing. So if you type how to make a poster into Google, um, there's gonna be a Canva link. And check out that Canva link because it's just a simple like landing page that goes through, how do you make a poster? And what I love about it is they're now tying that search query of how to make a poster and that landing page, you click on it, the main call to action, it takes you right into making a poster into the product. So I think there's just going to be in the future as it relates to marketing, that journey from someone finding out about you to that person finding out about your value of your product to their own degree is going to be a lot shorter. I love that you quoted um, Tara. I've known her for years and uh, she's, she's, awesome. she's yeah. super smart. Yeah, I, I've been trying to get her on a webinar. So Tara, if this gets back to you somehow, <laughs> please join us. <laughs> It'd be amazing to have you on. Um, and, and, and just to also um, echo on what you said, we also recently, uh, we released a, a sandbox um, with you know mock data and people can get in there and kind of try ProdPad for free, so to speak. Um, and the conversion rates are crazy. I mean, I think we've had something like 40%. Um, I'll get you more accurate numbers, but it's crazy. <laughs> and this was just a test. We just wanted to see if it would work and I can absolutely guarantee everyone um, that yes. And on top of that, we also have a trial. So the more you can expose people to, to what your product can do, uh, the definitely the more likely they are um, to, to convert. Uh, we are about two minutes away from our, um, our end, our time, uh, our beautiful time together today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, Wes, do you have a couple more minutes? Can you, uh, do you want to pick a question? We have so many questions. Uh, Scott, thank you for trying the sandbox. That's amazing. I just, I just caught that one. Uh, but we have so many questions. Uh, Wes, do you want to pick one and answer it? Uh, do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, I, I do have time for a couple more questions. I'm um, just scrolling through the ones in the question box, but uh, if there's any others that you want me to dig into then. I mean, there's so many that are really good. I'm gonna let you pick one. All right, here we go. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so um, Greg, you're mentioning like any tips for taking a product that grows strategy for B2B versus B2C. Um, I think this question is super interesting because at the end of the day, like whenever I think of the best product <laughs> companies, um, most of them started like B2C and they are, it's just like second nature for us whenever we're downloading an app or something on our phone. Like it has been product led for so long. 
And now it's only starting to uh, like wake up the B2B world of like, hey, this is the way people want to buy. And we've been training ourselves in the B2C space uh, for so long. So um, whenever it comes to B2B, there is different problems for sure. But the main kind of commonality is we do want that touchless experience. We do want to uh, experience about the product without having to talk to someone as part of our evaluation phase. Um, there is a couple big challenges and one of the ones I'll, I'll talk about is just onboarding accounts. That's still to this day, a very tricky problem because even a lot of the tools that we're looking at for product analytics and different pieces of the puzzle, um, most of them just focus on understanding just the user, which is helpful if you're a B2C company and you know that individual person is going to be the only person buying the products. Um, but in B2B, there is a, an interesting lens of how you're tracking these folks and really looking at accounts, how they're growing within your product. So um, yeah, that's one of the, the big challenges, but there's a ton you can learn from B2C companies as it relates to building a B2B business with product-led growth. Excellent. Thank you, Wes. Um, we've got one here that I find really interesting from Ian. Um, who's asking, we'd like to move away from a time-restricted trial as it doesn't seem to provide a value tipping point to a usage restriction, uh, but have found it difficult to determine which usage to focus on. Do you have any tips? Ooh, okay. So there's a lot going on in that question. And I know, the right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first problem I see as it relates to free trials is uh, like you really do have to have a product that has a super quick time to value. And one of the common problems I see a lot of companies make is they think, hey, like, let's just introduce a free trial uh, without thinking too much about, well, how long does it take for someone to experience the value of the product? Um, most of us, I don't know, might read a study. Uh, there's like some really well-known VCs, not going to name names, but like they'll pull up these studies and say, you know what, the, the 14th day free trial, it's the best one. Uh, you need this one. And it's like, come on. Like there's so many other factors here to, to really evaluate. Like that's, that's worthless. Uh, but people take it and say, okay, like everyone's doing 14 day trials. Let's, let's go with that. So um, yeah, there's an interesting issue to be avoided. And one of those ones uh, I'll give you an example. This company is called Tetra. Um, brilliant team. It's basically a company wiki. And so you used to be able to sign up for the product as like just a free trial. And I think they had 30 day free trial. So quite generous. And you would go into the product and it basically be like Google Docs. Like you're creating these documents for your company. And by the end of the 30 days, like they're expecting you to invite your colleagues and get more people on there. Um, but the problem with that is that people in that first 30 days, as far as a company wiki is related, um, they might have added, you know, a couple of docs. There, there wasn't like a, a substantial amount of value. Um, most of them would just kind of upgrade for, you know, a month or two to see what this would be like. And so the problem is you really need to, you um, have a model that allows for people to experience the full value of the product. In Tetra's case, that wasn't happening. And so they eventually rolled out a freemium model so that people on their own time could understand how to use this company wiki and get more value out of the company wiki. Um, so a lot of the times uh, it's the model's wrong. It's not necessarily like your onboarding is terrible uh, and all these other um, surface level problems that you might see. So great question. Excellent. Uh, with that, I think our time is now up. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, I know we have a ton more questions. We actually have 16 unanswered questions right now. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for, um, for joining, for asking your questions. Uh, we will be sending out this webinar over the next couple of days. We will also be sending Wes's contact information. Um, so you can ask him any questions uh, and you can join the, um, the product-led group as well. I'm part of the community and it is excellent. Lots of really smart people there. And um, so I would definitely encourage you to, to, to join if you can. I know everyone has like 25 Slack channels, if not more at this time, but this one is worth it. <laughs> uh, so, so definitely join. Uh, thank you again, Wes, um, for, for joining us today. Uh, no next month, we have uh, Yana Yushkina from uh, Google Search, who's going to talk to us about how to leverage uh, product, uh, sorry, how to leverage data for product design. So it's going to be a really, really good one. 
Um, hope to see everyone in our next session. Um, and again, Wes, um, have, uh, have a good one. And thanks again for joining us. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who's listening in for participating and asking some great questions. This was awesome. Bye everyone. Bye.